I have been um, attuned with the librarians, and today they've been um, sharing some wonderful lessons with me that um, are to continue the messages that they gave us last week about how stones and trees are kindred, their cousins. Um, and what interested me so much, and you all please feel welcome to interrupt and ask questions at any point, but what interested me so much was how their story, like when they were sharing how this is, they took this story back to the origin of all physical life. And in their mind, the connection of trees and stones being like siblings goes all the way back to like the Big Bang. And that's how far back they took me to show me this very sacred connection and how powerful it is to connect with rocks and trees because it connects us with the totality of history and the totality of beingness. They also were showing me how um, this story works when connecting with alternative timelines, which to be honest, really started messing with my head. <laughs> it's been an interesting week playing nursemaid to a family member all week and having the librarians like putting all this in. So, um, before we start, does anyone have questions or thoughts before we go forward? The librarians are with me, and they're kind of coaching me on what to say, but there's so much information they want to get through that I will remain intact, but they're like in the back of my head. It's like, they're, they're there. They're like right in the very back talking to me nonstop and putting like um, uh, translucent um, visions, videos playing in front of me. So I see all of you, but I'm also seeing like these movies that they're playing on a clear screen. So any questions, any thoughts, any comments only help them to direct the process better. Um, a comment from me, um, the way uh, they approach the just knowing that relationship between stone and uh, trees, rocks and trees being siblings, you know, made me think of everything being siblings. And I was feeling everything in my body, like, all the energetic levels, how I'm disposing of things from my body, I was actually really feeling it, like like a sister, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So that relationship extended to everything I was doing. Um, so I do appreciate that from the bottom of my heart to have uh, received a, uh, an approach to this idea in that yeah. sense. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. You know, they they were saying, like, we could take this in all directions, like, um, because everyone, everything serves a purpose. It just humanity has stepped away from our connection, uh, our total connection. And Erica, we've sort of lost our way with our purpose, which has put our you know, society, our collective, the human race in a kind of floundering way. And if it seems overwhelming, they say, just bring it down to yourself and your life. You know, how sometimes we, each of us lose our way. We, each of us feel like there's no use even going on. It's all going to be terrible. Nothing is working. We all have moments like that, or we have moments where we feel like we're the victim of our own lives, and yet somehow we work our way through it and we go forward and we learn powerful lessons on, 
you know, how to not be in the middle of these big messes as, and how to recognize messes, how to understand we don't need to be, uh, you know, taken advantage of or fooled or naive or too, you know, trusting everyone without discretion, you know, or so we learn to, we learn what we need to know to go forward with our personal power and integrity. Humanity is going through the same thing. You know, it's just every single one of us is going through this to some extent. I'm, uh, and one of the lessons they've been teaching me is how to look at our planet and each race of beings, be it a race of trees or a race of, you know, giraffes or a race of humans or, you know, through the mandala connections. And you can, you can see if you pull yourself out from a more cosmic perspective, you can see, you learn to really see these mandalas, these grids, these energy networks, these connections and how they support each other and how humanity's become more of like an attachment as opposed to part of the whole. But we can still return to part of the whole. And that's a big part of what we are all doing here. So yes, the idea of trees and rocks as siblings is a way of teaching us to reconceive our knowledge base and help us with feeling empowered with the work that we need to do. Totally. Yes. Bonita, is it because rocks are crystals well they were crystals at one point is that the idea because crystals and and uh, you know the consciousness of crystals um i don't know if you could address that thank you mm -hmm. crystals are one form of rock every rock has a persona and a purpose you know granite is very strong it's like a root chakra stone you can depend on it you can count on it Basalt can come in many shapes and forms. It's transformative. It begins as like gas and fire and liquid molten lava. And then when it hardens, it can be, you know, like uh, hairs of glass floating around that will kill anyone who breathes it in. Or it can be little glass pellets of obsidian. It can be uh, pohoihoi lava, which is very frothy and foamy, and you can crush it easily. Or it can be, um, you know, rivers of lava that as they cool, have this beautiful, uh, because the underside of the river, the inside is hot, and the top layer is crust up and cool as they're, they have the air. And as they cool, they slow, but they're still flowing, and they get this very ropey texture to them and they can be much harder. There's all kinds of this, but eventually pretty much all lava that's born from fire turns into soil or glass or sand and returns to earth as something that helps create life. It's very mineral and nutrient rich. Crystals are formed. There are, you know, a lot of wisdom and energy connection, energy direction. Crystals are formed often in caves, in places where just the right temperature and moisture and air pressure in an enclosed or fairly enclosed environment allows certain minerals over a long period of time to bond and grow you know, often from the gases within a cave, which is why we have such a great variety of crystals because each one grew and crystals grow, you know? Like, you know, magma lava is birthed violently. Crystals grow slowly over time. And things like granite grow under a great deal of pressure. They're like the weightlifters. So yes, all stones have a connection and 
every single one of our chakras connects not just with like, oh, you know, amethyst crystal, clear quartz, but with different kinds of earth rock. Does that answer your question? Wonderful. They're very excited. <laughs> um, I feel almost like a horse because they're like tugging at something in me. It's almost like I have like, I mean, I don't feel like I have gear on me like someone's riding a horse, but in a way it feels that way. They're kind of pulling at me and directing what I'm saying. <laughs> so trees as they, and all plants, like when they talk about trees, they say trees specifically because they're like the, the grandfathers of the land mass, the plants but all plants are in the same community and they work in harmony with each other pretty much. Um, as they grow from a little nut or seed or the seek no further trees, when certain trees like apple trees, when they fall down, the branches become new trees, which is why um, apple farms are often found on a mountain because they plant a bunch of mount apple trees on the mountaintop. And as the apple trees fall down the mountain, you get a mountain covered with apple trees. Each branch, you know, the branch is going to become new trees. So trees are grown from the ground. And the ground has a lot of the, the, um, the afterlife of the stones and the rocks and the crystals and the basalt. And it's all ground up. So it nourishes the trees, the plants to grow. And sometimes their roots are even wrapped around stones and crystals and rocks and basalt. And as they grow and they're bringing in moisture, they drink more from the roots than they do from their leaves. Although they drink both. You know, some trees you'll see whenever it might rain, you can tell because the leaves, which are normally pointed down like this, cup up like that, or sometimes even flip over like that. And whenever you see that, you know there's going to be rain. Old farmer's trick. <laughs> so the trees are absorbing energy from the divine, from the cosmos, from the universe, from the sky, and also energy from the earth. So their sap is running, their lifeblood is born from the minerals and the moisture, the water that flows through the dirt and the minerals. So the, the rocks in some ways are nourishing the trees to grow in all plants. And then when eventually the plants drop their leaves or they themselves pass from current life, they return to the soil and they mix with the minerals, they become one with the rocks and the minerals. This was the cycle that the librarians were explaining that every tree has within it rocks, be it through the sap or, you know, the connection. Rocks are part of the original creation of earth and their choice is then to give birth to plants give birth to trees. And the two of them are always in harmonic cycle together. I wouldn't say uh, symbiotic, but in harmonic cycle. So all of this began, and this is a story that Gaia and Mother Mary shared with me years ago about one day before we had our universe, uh, before there was even time, Gaia just felt like there needed to be more, that there needed to be, uh, that it was like a full existence for everyone without like the root chakra. Existence was all love and joy and upper chakras. And, you know, when you're in these other dimensions, it is really, really hard to work on the gravitas of existence. 
because there's so much like everyone's in harmony so it's like a, a choir missing the bass and the tenors so she decided to create physical reality to give everyone more support with exploring the totality of possibilities and uh, Gaia created the universe and I was so happy because she told me we tried again and again and again and I'm like really because we got one universe and then it was later that the scientists said oh there were multiple big bangs I'm like oh good affirmation <laughs> Because I've been telling people for years that there have been multiple Big Bangs. And I had no proof. So I was so glad when proof caught up with divine understanding. So Gaia created all of physical reality. And created timelines, space, everything that we exist in. This was really exciting. I mean, imagine you are like someone truly divine. And then suddenly this entire playground is created for you to explore. They got to go do things and see things and, you know, enjoy things that they could never even conceive of before. And things that had been so difficult to learn. Now it's difficult to experience, but easy to learn. So Gaia created, decided to create this ring of planets in one of which was Earth here. They, every time I talk with any divine beings, they call it like the Earth Project. You know, it's, it's a big project. Gaia called representatives from everywhere. Every when, how, why. Representatives from every dimension, every frequency, every collective, every race every whatever to come and help gather stardust debris and to bring it in closer and closer and closer until gravity existed and pulled it further in there are people on our planet who were here at this time and it's always a delight to talk with them because um they remember it you can ask them they remember it exactly as i am teaching at this moment so all of this great space dust was brought together and circling all around it were representatives from everywhere they seeded the earth with frequencies and elements from their collectives their dimensions they seeded it so here on earth in the here and now we have elements of every dimension every race every being existing here which makes this a very very special place where i mean we're not a clutter drawer we are like an amazing planet surrounded by an amazing galaxy that has elements of every dimension in here if we can learn to really be harmonic, each of us individually be harmonic with any element, we can connect from that to those who seeded our planet with it and even go and visit with them. There are some people who are excellent at doing this. It is amazing spending time with them. As our planet, which was, you know, at first a whole bunch of dust, and then as it got closer into gravity, it was a whole lot of hot dust. And then it became a fireball and of like gas and heat and toxic energy. And eventually it cooled and cooled and cooled. Um, a meteor came and it hit a big chunk off, and that went off and became the moon. And then, you know, the Earth became powerful enough that, you know, it, it formed its own sphere for the second time because the moon left a big chunk out and had to reform. So we were, the earth was originally really transformative. 
And as Earth cooled and the gases started floating off, we got atmosphere, hemisphere, water. All the water we have on our planet now is the water that was in our planet and on our planet five billion years ago. Think of that. Our planet is amazing. As it cooled and things settled, you know, and of course, don't get me started on plate tectonics. I'll keep us forever on that. There were multiple dynasties of life that existed even before the Atlantean time, even before any of that. There were multiple life forms that existed. And the planet, our planet has changed its atmosphere, its climate zones frequently over the billions, you know, the last three and a half billion years or so. So there have been rises of like giant beings that then for whatever reason, you know, they would fall. And then another rise of giant beings that would fall until humanity, all of the rises and falls of beings were caused by nature. They were caused by too many volcanoes erupting, changing climate zones. They were, you know, destroyed by uh, glaciers coming and covering the world with ice, by the KT mass extinction of a meteor. Hit if that meteor had hit, even 10 minutes later, the dinosaurs would not have become extinct. Talk about terrible timing. It hit in the Gulf of Mexico and basically wiped off 90 some percent of all life on the planet within even the other side of the planet within weeks. Everyone's, you know, the whole planet was toxic. And yet life came back again. The very, very tiny little mammals that lived deep underground became eventually all the animals that are around now, pretty much. So life continues on Earth. It always continues. There have been rises and falls of amazing animals. Humans, well, those that we call the Atlanteans, of course, were the first rise. And the giants, the great ones, they had too much arrogance and they fell. You know, and then, of course, the Sasquatch beings decided that they wanted to live in harmony. So they just kind of shifted to a different frequency. They're on our planet with us, but they're, they're behind a shimmering veil most of the time. And they're really wonderful. They're, they're so kind-hearted and wise. They live, usually you'll see them around trees. They like to be in trees because there's so much wisdom there. So as the rise for humans around the time humanity started coming along, there, were, there was a beautiful planet in harmony. All the forests, all the rivers, all the fields, everything was a cohesive network of energetic connection. Wherever humans went, other life forms died, which is amazing because think about this. Humans, we are puny. And yet if you go to um, Australia, as soon as humans arrived in Australia, all the dinosaurs died. Like they could stomp on us, they could eat us, no problem. But humanity, in our desire to travel the world and live out of connection with all other life, we became um, uh, we became toxic to everyone. We destroyed their environment, even back when we were like cave people. We were destroying the environment for all other animals. So it's very sad. But with this connection of seeing how stones and trees are connected 
It is a message of helping us return to the harmony of the history of our planet. Every single crystal that we connect with is connected to somewhere else. It can take you on a journey. One day we'll have Kim join us, bring our crystals, and she can take us on crystal journeys. She, there's no one better than her to do that. <laughs> so when we look at the plants that have risen up, then we look at how humanity has gone and destroyed so many plants. And when we look at the rocks that like, think about it, we have a fiery hole, a fire pit in the center of earth. And the further we go from the center of earth, the cooler the ground becomes and the water and the soils. And of course, it's not like in layers of just one texture. There's multiple textures everywhere. So imagine like a building that has cracks in it so that all of the gases and the waters and the, the lava that's in the earth is always rising up through whatever crevices it can find. And this causes the plate tectonics to occur so that the land for masses, you know, our continents are always moving, always moving. The Atlantic Ocean is always absorbing the Earth's crust in back to the center of the Earth. And the Pacific Ocean is always sending the, the core of the Earth out to the face of the planet. We have a very active planet. Some of these rocks that we meet that we find are literally thousands, millions, billions of years old. They can be carbon dated. Imagine you have a rock forming like deep in earth and plate tectonics carries it an inch at a time to the surface of earth. That rock has experienced every layer of our planet. It has the wisdom, the energy, the knowledge, the connections of every layer of the planet. And then it offers its wisdom, its frequency to feed the trees. This is really a harmonic process. And then think about it, the giraffes, the pandas come along, they eat the leaves. The orangutans, they eat the leaves. They're absorbing the frequency, the energy of the entire planet with every bite of food. We also have the potential to do this when we eat plants that have grown. We have the, the potential to really connect with what is all the journey of every element that fed this plant that then I am ingesting into my body. So before we continue, does anyone have any questions? I know this is a little etheric today. Hi, Benita, I have a question. Yes. You mentioned the face of the earth that the Pacific Ocean does. I don't, I've never heard of the face of the earth. So can you say a little bit more about that? Oh, um, yeah. Well, the, the face of the earth is, I'm asking them, it's the earth's crust, the outer layer of the, of the earth. Okay. Um, it's where... The express, they're saying it's where the expressions occur. Mm. I had another question about the New Madrid Fault. Mm -hmm. I've been hearing things about it and just wanted to know what your take was on what's happening now. Well, part of the issue now due to human interference with the global climate change is the, with the ice caps melting and the glaciers melting. It's having a couple of effects on the water. 
Now, when you think about it, like the oceans and the seas, they're not just like stable water. They have breezes and currents and channels as much underwater as we have in the air above water. You know, if you have two land masses that sort of come together a little bit, the water that flows through becomes a little compressed and it creates sort of like the equivalent of a wind tunnel only for water. And if you have water coming from two different directions and meeting, you have maybe a warmer water and a cooler water, they're going to meet. They're not going to just blend. The warmer water might go atop and the cooler water below and they cross each other that way. So our the world, the water world of our planet is very dynamic. With the melting of the ice caps, we're bringing cool water, more cool water into the ocean, which is not just cooling the ocean. It's not like an ice cube just sitting in a glass of lemonade. It is changing the currents and, you know, all of the activity. We also are putting more, uh, we are lowering the salinity of the ocean. And all of the, the life forms there are used to, you know, they've evolved to a certain level of salinity. As the salinity is changing, it's also impacting the uh, plants and corals and animals that live in the ocean in different ways. That is a whole thing. The other thing it's doing is putting more weight on the ocean floor. So our planet has a few options, either absorb a lot of more water as moisture into the air to create more rain, or just deal with the more pressure and the changing currents. Like where I normally live in Maine, off the coast of Maine, the Gulf Stream has been redirected. It no longer flows the way it used to. It's been redirected and goes directly to Maine. So the ocean water off the coast of Maine is now warmer than it's, up, than it's been in recorded time. So the areas that normally where the Gulf Stream would go to, the animals that live there are like, you know what, it's getting a little cold now. We want to stay in the Gulf Stream, which means they're not going where they used to go. They're going elsewhere. One way or another, they're adapting or they're dying. So there is either a heightened state of evolution or a heightened state of death or both. All of this added water pressure or all the weird rainstorms we're getting that we're not used to because you know some of it evaporates, all of this added water pressure on the ocean floor is having certain effects. Like in Miami now, they're having like every week or two manholes in the downtown area are geysering water because you know Miami is kind of uh, with the ocean pushing in, imagine like, you know, popping a big pimple. The ocean water pushing in is compressing the groundwater, and the groundwater then is going up through the manholes. In other areas where there's volcanoes, these volcanoes are getting some added pressure. For some volcanoes, it's irrelevant because their uh, magma chamber is so deep below that a little added pressure has no impact. For other volcanoes, it has a lot of impact. Uh, if the magma chamber is a little closer to the, or is has, if it was maybe going to erupt in the next couple of hundred years, it's like, yeah, why not now? Feeling a little pressure, peer pressure here. And also this added pressure of the water is really messing with the different rift zones. So it is impacting even on a small level, the plate tectonics activity. So, <laughs> Tiffany, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. I, Thank you. I'm afraid I answered it too much. I apologize if I got dry there. <laughs> so, our job, those of us who are here, our job is to help with 
the forward healing of our planet. There are things happening on our planet that makes us really sad, all of us. And we have no real ability, as far as we know, to impact some of this beyond just acknowledging that tragedies have occurred ever since some meteor hit, you know, a big chunk of Earth and made the moon. You know, that maybe I think was the first act of major violence on our planet. And since then, we tragedies have happened. You know, races and species and societies have come and gone. The Earth continues. It is our hope to help the Earth find its gentlest possible path towards what is you know, guaranteed to be a beautiful future because that's what Earth does. It goes through rough times and it finds its way to a beautiful future, just like that's what we try to do in our lives. We all have rough times in our lives and we try to find our way to a beautiful future. We we'll always find our way back to joy. Our planet will do the same thing. We would like to be involved with that. And we'd like to bring some of our friends along. So the librarians suggest we really connect with trees and rocks because that is a wonderful starting place. And from there, we are able to, each of us in our own unique path, find our paths with what helps us with bringing good energy and enlightenment to our planet. Are those some of the things that you're going to talk about tonight? Yes. Let's start a meditation. <laughs> 